Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a great sleep last night. Sleeping is indispensable for our survival. The longest time an individual has gone without sleep has been 11 days, 264 hours. Now, you might be wondering, who did this and why? It was Rodney Gardner for a science fair project in 1965. In an NPR interview in 2015, he described how this experiment undermined his health. He did not only lose in his perception and conception, but also memory loss. A memory loss that was so substantial that he mentioned it was like an early Alzheimer's brought by the lack of sleep. Now, please raise your hand if you prioritize something else above your sleep. No, believe me, I've done this multiple times. Either to go to a party, pull an all-nighter, or even just watch a Netflix show or just scrolling through TikTok. Frankly, sometimes we just have a lot of things going on or we're not in the mood or simply we're just in our bed being like, when will I fall asleep? Being honest, I didn't think much of the process of sleeping. I mean, we go to sleep every night, we might remember our dream, wake up, and go through this cycle over and over again. However, I realize that sometimes we deem everything as normal and we don't take the time to consider how impactful these processes are. And by studying this topic, I realized there's a whole end of possibilities within dreams. It tells us so much about ourselves. And now, I'll be teaching you how to rethink in this topic and hopefully make you question things that you seem as ordinary. It was in 1953. 67 years ago that we were finally able to make the correlation between physical actions and dream recall. 67 years ago. We had no idea why we dreamt. Why do I remember my dreams sometimes and sometimes we don't? The people who found this out were Eugene Horizinski and Nathan Kleidman. And in their discovery that found that when we go through rapid eye movement, also known as REM, we tend to remember our dreams. In their study, they highlighted how 74.1% of participants remembered their dreams when they went through REM sleep, in contrast with 17.4% when they didn't undertake this process. Now, how does this process work exactly? So when we go through REM, we go through five stages. In the first stage, we're only asleep for five to 10 minutes and we don't really feel like we're sleeping at all. On the second stage, we're asleep for 10 to 15 minutes and during this stage, our wavelengths start to slow down and we have occasional sleeping spindles. And what basically happens during this time is that uh, there are neurons who send to our nervous systems to relax and basically block all levels of stress. Now, in the third stage, nothing much else happens. However, during this stage and the fourth stage, it is believed that repair hormones are released. During the fourth stage, our breathing continues to slow down and everything happens within our medial contracts to the hippocampus. And lastly, the fifth stage, our blood pressure rises. Part of our body becomes paralyzed, such as our arms, our legs, and we begin rapid eye movement. This stage tends to last about 90 minutes overall, and this repeats constantly throughout the night. And well, when we don't go through REM sleep, we go through non-REM sleep. And basically, we just go over the first three stages throughout the night. Now, what are some of the consequences of sleep deprivation? To begin with, it can lead to heart failure and stroke, anxiety, depression, immune system, deficiency, and it's extremely important. But what I found most interesting is that if our sleep tends to be more constant, our body temperature is more constant as well. And well, as I mentioned before, 67 years. So what did previous civilizations think about it? 
Personally, this is the part I find most interesting. As we get to see the interconnectedness of society and how we have a human creative thinking way. So in ancient Egypt, this was this legend of Tutmos the Fourth, and he was a ruler. But the reason he became a ruler, according to him, was that when he was dreaming, he saw that if he took sand of a sphinx, he would become a ruler. And at the time, they believed that dreams had the answers to the future or the blessings of the gods. And they basically agreed as a collective that they needed to have consultants of these dreams. And for example, a bad dream for them was to see themselves in the mirror as they thought, oh damn, I gotta go find a new spouse. Or in the contrary, a blessing if they saw a full moon. Moreover, with the aboriginals, we kind of see a different reflection on dreaming. They thought it was a continuous reality that let them talk with the ancestors of the land. It was until 1966 that the meaning of dreams wrote by Calvin Hall Spring Jr. brought in a new proposal. He said that the images of dreams are the concrete embodiments of dreamer thoughts. These images give visual expression to that which is invisible, namely conceptions. And along with Robert Band the Castle, in 1966, they came with something called the content system. And within this system, they used empirical and theoretical analysis to come to a conclusion. Besides the trial and error, they focused in identity for the theoretical aspect. And this connects to very, two important theories, fraud and junk. Sigmund Freud talks about psychic casualty, which basically means every thought, every dream, every single thing we feel does not happen at random. Meanwhile, Jung's archetype theory established that there's three components in every individual. We have an ego, a personal subconscious in which we tend to undermine aspects of ourselves, and a collective subconscious. Moreover, he believed there were four archetypes that persevered in society. The first, the persona. In persona, he believed that depending on the context you were with, and who you were with, your personality tends to change. Moreover, the shadow, which kind of builds into the idea of all those ideas and thoughts we tend to repress about ourselves. The third one was anima or animus, which basically established how exterior factors affect us, and this includes the status quo. And lastly, the self, which is basically our individuality. And now, you might be wondering, why do we care about this in the 21st century? And why do we still have to believe that dreams are a reflection of ourselves? First of all, Kerry Morwich and Michael Norton, who has a PhD at Harvard University, made an experiment where they realized that 65% of individuals believe dreams have hidden messages. And what happens with this? Despite there being the possibility that this is a subconscious process, we tend to give it our own interpretation. We, through our dreams, show our personal biases and experiences. Moreover, there seems to be a correlation with personality. Makamara, in 1973, decided to explore on Freud's theory and discovered that there seems to be a correlation of higher dream recall when a person has attachment issues. Moreover, here is an image of the most common dreams in every country. And one of the dreams that appears everywhere, literally in every continent, are snakes. While snakes tend to have different interpretations, they tend to be associated with fear. And this shows anima or animus and how we as a society share common ideas. Moreover, in the Plains Vision Quest, written by a religious professor, Lee Irwin, he quoted, all dreams are part of an encounter of drama or cultural enactments by which culture is further transformed. 
Now we're going to be doing a breathing exercise to calm ourselves and this can be very helpful for when we're dreaming or when we just want to relieve some anxiety. It's been a rough day guys so I hope this can help you get rid with everything that's been going on with your week. So we're going to breathe in. breathe out. Yeah, that was a very long one, guys. <laughs> and we're going to do it again. <laughs> so hold your breath. Finally, right? <laughs> now, what is the current research that's going on right now? So now we're trying to lean into how we can manipulate dreams and interfere with what's going on in them. And one of the most fascinating research I found was Dormio, which is an experiment being done by MIT Interfaces Group. And what they found out is that during semi-lucid dreams, they can interfere. And how do they do it? Well, they use this magnetic glow of which can detect your skin's conductance and heart rate. And when this links with your subconsciousness, it records a conversation and can kind of see what's going on within your dream. However, we're still not able to manipulate or control what's going on. So maybe we'll just still see tall giraffes and pink balloons and be wondering, what the hell is this? So to conclude, I want to provide a brief roadmap and conclusion of what I said. We leave and go through REM and non-REM sleep throughout the night. And frankly, we just made this discovery 67 years ago. We, this is still a whole end of possibilities, and there's a lot of theories of how this ties back to us. We sometimes need to contemplate and just stop for a minute to think. Let's rethink what we're doing, rethink what's going on in our scenarios, and I hope you continue to enjoy the presentations. Thank you.